As promised earlier, we have a great interview with Sean O'Banion, movie producer, and someone who might have gotten a start in the business by sneaking onto the Universal set and blending into the crew of Quantum Leap. Sean O'Banion began his career as a production assistant on Sequest DSV after sneaking onto the Universal Studios lot at age 17. After several more years as a PA on feature films, he eventually began to seek a position as a personal assistant. The career change proved a wise step, and he soon found himself working for and with some of the industry's most well-known and well-respected talent, both in front of and behind the camera, including Academy Award winner Christopher Walken, Jack Black, Ben Stiller, and acclaimed directors Joe Wright, Judd Apatow, and Academy Award nominee Peter Hedges. After years of watching and learning, O'Banion moved into producing in 2007 with Dakota Sky. The film became a cult hit and remained in the top 100 on Netflix for the next five years. In 2010, he produced Girlfriend, for which he received an IFP Gotham Award. He joined the Producers Guild in 2011 and produced The Automatic Hate in 2013. The film will be released in 2015. Currently, he is in development on several films, including one with partner Shannon Mullen and Academy Award winner Bruce Cohen. Mr. O'Banion, thank you for joining us on the Quantum Leap podcast. I understand you have an interesting story about one of your first experiences on a filming set, and it was Quantum Leap. Yeah, thanks for having me, by the way. I snuck into Universal, believe it or not, when I was 11 years old. Uh, It was the first time I did it. Uh, because I had read an article about how Spielberg had done it. Of course, he did it when he was just 19 or something. But I figured, oh, I, I'm 11 years old. I could do it. And I actually did. I walked right past security, and nobody questioned me at all. And I knew at that time that Quantum Leap was being shot at Universal. I wasn't sure where, but I basically wandered the lot for a few days and, and figured out that they were on a stage near the front lot. And I can't remember, it was maybe like stage four or eight. It was one of the smaller stages at the front and then just sort of wandered into the sound stage and, and very quickly uh, realized that they were doing an episode on a train, which of course was later revealed to me. It was called Honeymoon Express. And uh, I got to spend uh, at least three or four days just hanging around watching them shoot Honeymoon Express, which was to me pretty stunning because I'd never... You know, I, as a kid, 11 years old, you sort of always just think, well, if they're on a train, then they just go film on a real train somewhere. But this was a train inside the soundstage and I had green screen out the windows. And, you know, I got to watch the whole process. And then uh, at a certain point, I guess I was I, I was noticed by Scott and Dean Stockwell. And I remember a specific day, uh, maybe one of my last days on that episode, where the company broke for lunch, and the guy said, what are you doing, kid? And I said, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they said, well, you want to you sit here and have lunch with us? And I said, sure. And uh, Scott walked over and grabbed a couple of apple boxes from a cart nearby, and they had sandwiches. And, and uh, Dean, I think, offered me half a sandwich. And we sat there on apple boxes in the center of the soundstage, and just the three of us <laughs> had lunch. Uh, and I think I revealed to them, if I remember correctly, they said, hey, who do you know here? How'd you get in here? And I said, nobody. I snuck in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think they both really got a kick out of that. So, you know, Dean asked me, I think, what I wanted to do. And I said, I want to make films. And, uh, you know, he, of course, told me that he'd been making films since he was younger than I was. And Scott was really great, said that he didn't know initially that he wanted to be an actor. He had started out doing something else. And I think his father was a lawyer and uh, he was maybe going to go into law, uh, but somehow realized that that wasn't it for him uh, and became an actor. And I actually was already a fan of his prior to Quantum Leap because he had done a Disney movie. I don't know if you remember, but he did a Disney like movie that we called I Man. The I stood for indestructible. And it was kind of like, a, it was like a, movie where he was on the run from everybody, but he couldn't be blown up or anything. So I kind of knew who he was from that Disney movie. And they were just really great with me, really great. So then after that episode, I think I I could only come back one day for the next episode, which was Disco Inferno. But I came back one day and got to see one of the stunt people do a high fall through like this slatted roof thing, uh, which was really cool as a kid to see that. And then the next episode that I spent the, the most time on, I think I spent maybe seven or eight days on the set was uh, 
Machiko McKenzie, which was all about sort of post-war racism, uh, in which uh, Sam is comes back uh, married to a Japanese woman. And so I think, yeah, I even went on location with them. I don't remember how I did it. I think I just wow. got in bands when they were <laughs> they were leaving the lot. I would go to this little farmhouse. But yeah, I spent uh, I spent a good amount of time on the show, and it was a huge, huge deal for me. It was the very first time that I had been exposed to actual production and seeing how the shots are set up and, you know, how the rehearsals are done and all that kind of stuff. So, and then of course, at the time it was my absolute favorite show. So it was about as big a thrill as you could give an 11 year old kid. Was there a constant fear of getting caught? No, you know, I think, um, and I was sort of, I teach filmmaking now too. And the way that I got into the business by sneaking in when I was, just about 18 or maybe I just turned 18. I just celebrated my 21st year in the, in the industry. And I think when you're that age, 11 through like 17, you know, you don't really think about consequence so much. Mm -hmm. I did eventually get caught when I was 11 or 12, I think, because I was walking around the, the exterior facade, you know, like Back to the Future and, and all that. Oh, wow. um, the, the, out, the outdoor portion of the lot and nobody goes back there unless they're in a golf cart or you know they're in a car you know you don't you kind of don't it's 420 acres the whole lot so you don't really just kind of end up back there you know uh and i and i did eventually get caught because i was walking back there i walked through the western sets and i walked through the new york sets and then i found myself in hill valley and a guy in a golf cart stopped me and said, what are you doing? Who are you with? You know, what are you doing back here? And I said, I'm just, I'm with myself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was like, no, 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 no. Get get in the golf cart. And, he, and I got in the car and then he took me up to the security office and they told me that I was trespassing and that I was, you know, breaking the law and my parents could be held liable. And they took a Polaroid of me and stuck it up on the wall. And, oh, and, and I think, I think it was more for show than any, I think they were trying to scare me. But, but yeah, to answer your question, uh, I just, it never occurred to me that what I was doing was something that I could get in trouble for, you know? And once I was on the sound stage, I think everybody assumes that you're somebody's kid or you're somebody's nephew or whatever, and nobody really asks. It's really funny. I mean, you know, granted, this was pre-9-11 and even before, uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, in the late 80s, there was a security guard, a disgruntled security guard who had been fired and put on his guard uniform and went back into the lot and basically set the back lot on fire. Yeah. Uh, and arson. Um, and a huge portion of it burned. And so obviously after that, security got a lot tighter, but I was still able to get my way in there and by somewhat unscrupulous means. I mean, you certainly couldn't do it today, but it, but it was easier then. And I just think as a kid, I just thought, you know, what... <laughs> what's the worst that can happen or, or maybe even more so just I didn't care you know it was like I gotta get in there I gotta see them do this stuff and so I did and then sort of you know at least the reason I got to hang out on Quantum Leap for the next couple of episodes was because Scott and Dean knew me at that point and used to come over in between scenes and just talk to me and say oh, what you doing today you know I mean they, they knew the secret wow. <laughs> which is that I didn't belong and they thought it was cool so uh, these guys are really as cool as everybody says they are. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm jealous. I have friends that are working on uh, NCIS New Orleans right now, literally in New Orleans, and they're working with Scott. And I'm like, wow, he's such a cool guy. Mm. And Dean is great, too. I, you know, I've actually not seen either of them in person since I was 11 years old, but my friends over there in Louisiana tell me that Scott is just as nice now as he was then. That's awesome. And uh, you actually ended up getting in the business when you were, what, 18? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, in um, in August, 21 years ago, I got my first job by sneaking in again and hanging out on uh, Sequest, which was, a, for me, also a big deal. I, I wasn't a huge fan of the show. It was pretty new when I got on. But what I was a fan of was that Spielberg was a producer on it and Amblin was a producer on it and that sort of the pinnacle for me that my first ever job would be that. And so for about the last two decades, I've been working on film and television. And for the last eight years, I've been uh, producing my own projects, two of which are on Hulu now. One is called Dakota Sky, which is sort of a 
teen coming of age story. It's an R rated movie though, so people with young kids should be careful. Uh, a lot of language. Uh, and the next one is called Girlfriend, which is about a young man with Down syndrome who romances a girl that he went to high school with, uh, a girl who does not have Down syndrome. And we won the Gotham Award for that one in New York. So pretty, pretty cool. Both of those films look pretty good. Uh, Girlfriend really piqued my interest because uh, maybe it's because uh, the episode Jimmy and uh, the other episode that Jimmy was in, but I've always had uh, like a place in my heart for kids with Down syndrome. Yeah, it's a, it's a really complicated, challenging uh, film. You know, it's definitely indie drama. But our lead actor, uh, Evan Snyder, is just extraordinary. He is an extraordinary person. I think he was 31 when we shot. He's now 35 or 36, maybe. And I still talk to him. I talked to him on the phone the other day. He's really, really talented. And we were hoping that our movie would sort of get him uh, greater opportunities as an actor, but so far he hasn't done anything outside of theater after our film. But uh, if anyone's looking for a really stellar actor who has Down syndrome, you could do far worse. <laughs> and uh, Dakota Sky is about a girl with a superpower of sorts. Yeah, uh, Dakota Sky is about a girl who's about to enter her final year of high school, and she has a power that whenever someone lies, she hears the truth. And we sort of let the audience in on that because whenever someone lies in the movie, we put up a subtitle that actually says what they really mean or what the <laughs> truth is. Um, so it's it's pretty funny, and it's also dramatic. She's facing all the things that young girls face at that age and in high school, and the only difference is that there are no secrets for her, you know, um, which makes her fairly angry and apathetic. Uh, but then she meets a boy who may have the ability to never lie, and it sort of changes her life. And actually, the screenwriter of that is working on a novel that leads up to... Actually, no, I think he's just doing a novelization of our film. But there's a little audio thing that we've put together that will tell you the story that happens right before the movie starts. So it's pretty cool. It sounds cool. And uh, you're working on a new one that's coming out soon? I've produced a film called The Automatic Hate, which hopefully will be coming out later this year. It stars Joseph Cross, who was in Milk and Lincoln. It has Adelaide Clemens, who's on television now, and Rectify, things on the Sundance Channel. And then we have Deborah Ann Wall from True Blood. We have Richard Schiff from The West Wing and Ricky Jay, who works a lot with Paul Thomas Anderson and David Mamet. And it's a very, very uh, dark, really impressive screenplay by a guy named Justin Lerner, who actually wrote and directed Girlfriend. So it was continuing on with that same filmmaker. Um, and then I'm working on a number of other projects. But nothing in the sci-fi genre, at least not yet. Mm -hmm. Trying to get to my own version of Quantum Leap. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> For a lot of your career, you were an assistant, production assistant, different kinds of assistants. What are some uh, cool things that stand out in your career? You've worked on a lot of major films that everybody has seen. What is that like? I think... For me, a lot of it is it, it's tough to sort of say because for me, at a, at a certain point, it became just about a job. Although I will say that, you know, working on, say, something like um, the Matrix films was a pretty big deal. I mean, we were working on the sequel, so we knew the first movie. And my friend and I worked on that in San Francisco, and we just sort of, you know, we knew. We were like, this is cool. Like, everybody wants to be on this movie, and we're on the movie we got the job and we were seeing some pretty extraordinary things. I mean, the, the freeway chase, a lot of people don't even realize that that's all practical stuff. I mean, we built a, not we, but the art department built a three and a half mile freeway set on an abandoned airfield in Alameda, California. And they had something like 50 stuntmen and we spent six weeks uh, just destroying cars and driving trucks and motorcycles through everything. <laughs> it was just they did some things in that movie that were mind blowing. And then, you know, I, I've just, I've worked with a lot of great people. I started, one of my first assisting jobs was Courtney Cox and uh, David Arquette. And they were just two really, really excellent, nice people. And, you know, I've, I've had my share of not so nice people, but <laughs> Courtney and David uh, were really just wonderful to work for and with. And they really took care of me um, and just, that was on Ready to Rumble? The first movie I did with them, I don't remember what order it is, Screen 3, and then they did a movie that they actually produced 
that was called The Shrink Is In, which I don't even know if it ever got any release here. But it was a funny movie, and Courtney and Dave were the producers, so started there and then moved on to, I think, maybe then we went to Screen I think that's what happened. And then I went with David to Ready to Rumble. Was that fun? Was also cool. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of weird Yeah, I mean, I, crazy I, I'm stuff. not much of a wrestling guy, but, you know, it, it was cool to see how it all happened, for sure. And we had uh, all the real guys. We had Sting and Diamond Dallas and all these kind of guys. And Scotty Kahn, who, of course, went on to Entourage and, and now uh, Hawaii Five-0. So, yeah, some just some cool people. I worked for Ben Stiller for about a year. had a really good experience doing that. I had Starsky and Hutch and... Along came Polly and... Duplex? Yeah, I did reshoots on Duplex, the end of Duplex. Is that kind of how that happens? You kind of get with one actor and stick with them for a while, or is it just worked out that way? I think if you have a good rapport with somebody, particularly in that position, they're looking for people that they can trust and people that sort of understand the way they work and the level of you know discretion because you're hearing things that shouldn't go out publicly and whatnot. Um, so I think... You know, yeah, if somebody if somebody really trusts you and feels comfortable with you, you know, generally you can stay in that position for a long time if you want to. And of course, my goals were about trying to get to a place where I was making films as opposed to running around and making sure that they had the right coffee while they were making films. <laughs> um, so eventually I had to I had to move along. Or, you know, if you're stiller, it was all about Snapple and a certain type of water. But, um, <laughs> but uh it was all really great experience. It was all very good experience. Was it like a evolving process where you still working as assistant while you're trying to become a producer? Did one day you just say, this is it, I'm going to start doing my own thing? No, it was definitely an evolving process. Being an independent film producer is not the best or fastest way to make money. So inevitably, even after my first film, I think right before my first movie I produced, I was working for Judd Apatow. And then I went to do that movie, and I had been offered a position to stay on with Judd and his family and basically said, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity, but I, I got to go off and do this. Uh, so I went, but when I came back, you know, at a certain point, you end up spending more money while you're there, <laughs> mm. uh, you know, trying to make these little movies. So eventually I go back and call some people up and say, hey, if anybody's looking for help, uh, I'm available kind of a thing. So you go back and forth. I'm working on some larger projects now that I think in the distance I can see hopefully a slight change in terms of income and, and level of success in terms of when you do these smaller movies. You're not always guaranteed theatrical release. You're not even guaranteed really that you'll make any money sort of on the back end of things. So they're all little lottery tickets is what I call them. Each one is sort of a little opportunity that, you know, it could be a huge thing or it could end up just sort of going to VOD and not being seen by as many people. I mean, Girlfriend, we got a theatrical release. We played New York, uh, L.A., Boston, I think Chicago maybe. But, you know, they're all experiences that, that teach you different things, not only about the process, but about how release works and how you get a film marketed to people and how you get people's eyes on even a festival. So... It all has value for sure. And frankly, going back to Quantum Leap, you know, and looking at the way that those guys treated me as a kid has a huge effect on the way that I interact with crew that I hire or the way that I expect actors on our projects to interact with people, particularly the indie level, because you just have to, everybody has to be playing the same game. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you have to be a team. It all goes all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the way back to Quantum Leap, my first experience. Being a movie producer, when people find out, do they pitch you their idea for a movie? I would say it's 50-50. In L.A., people are accustomed to just meeting film people all the time. So it doesn't happen so much. It happens a lot when you go on location. All of my films so far have been done on location. The first one was in Arizona. The girlfriend was in the Boston area. And the last one was upstate New York. And so there are always people going, oh, yeah, I got an idea. I got an idea for a movie. But more frequently these days with the ease of contacting people is people email me through my company website and uh, and say, hey, what about this? Somebody sent me a documentary the other day and said, hey, what about this idea? And I sort of have to say, well, can't really accept unsolicited material. I have to come through agencies or whatever. 
but it is something that happens you know, about half the time when you meet people. If they're not in the film business, they definitely want to try and pitch you their idea. If they are, they sort of know that that's not the way it's done. But then, you know, at the same time, I'm I'm also, you know, I call myself sort of a, a, a junior producer right now. You know, I have a couple small credits, nothing quite far over a million dollars at this point. So I'm not exactly a target for people to try and get stuff done. Since your Quantum Leap experience as a child, are you more likely to, if you see a kid hanging out on the set, not notice him, let him slide? I would definitely notice them, but I, I mean, I can give you an example. Years ago, I was working on a FX TV movie, and the drivers on the show knew how I had gotten into business and my story. You know, I'd sort of gotten around partly because I like to tell it because it's fun. Um, but uh, there were these two guys. I think they were at like you know New York Film Academy, LA, or something, and they were they saw the trucks and they pulled over. And they started talking to the drivers. And the drivers called me on the walkie-talkie and said, hey, Sean, why don't you come over? So I walked over, and they were like, hey, these two guys want to know how you get in and how it all works. And and so I sort of basically took them. And I was like, yeah, follow me, guys. Are you hungry? Do you want to come to craft service? And took them in the set and let them look around. And, and it happened in a similar way with a guy who approached me on the streets. I was working on another TV show then, uh, watching Ellie, this, this thing with um, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. And um, this guy came up to me on the street and said, hey, I just moved from New York and I don't know anybody here and I'm trying to get jobs. And, you know, if, if, if there's any way that I could do anything on this show or, you know, you recommend me to people in the future, I'd really appreciate it. And I sort of turned to him, was standing with a friend of mine and I turned to him, I said, you get your resume? He said, yeah, yeah, it's in the car. I have it in the car. I said, okay, go get it. And he ran to his car and he got his resume and he came back and, you know, I looked it over. He had actually, it wasn't going to be his first job. He had worked for Robert De Niro in New York. But I looked at the resume. I said, all right, all right, don't worry about it. And he said, what do you mean? I said, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. And he said, wait, what does that mean? Like, don't promise me anything if you're not going to do it, because then I'll just be waiting for the phone. Ring. I said, no, no, I'm, I'm not like that. I'm serious. So we'll, we'll take care of you. And we started getting him jobs. And uh, my friend and I got him a job on the 24, you know, like I think it was like second or third season or something by then and got him regularly working to the point that he didn't need our help anymore. He was working on his own. And then he had something happen in his life that sort of made him realize that production wasn't what he wanted to do, but he wanted to work in post-production. And he had taught himself how to edit and got himself a job at a post company in Hollywood and was cutting promos and DVD special features and things like that. And then when my first movie came up, and became a reality the director slash co-producer had put the money in and we were going to make it i said we need an editor um and of course in the industry you you sort of collect people that are your friends and they all have these different skills and film people just tend to know a lot of other film people so i said we need an editor and he said yeah but we don't know any editors and i said yeah i think i do and so i called this guy up his name was jeff and i put him together with the director and he ended up cutting dakota scott and then I did the same thing on Girlfriend, put him with that director, and he ended up cutting Girlfriend. And uh, the last film as well, same, same writer-director. So I said, you know, can you use Jeff again? Yes, we are. Okay. Good. So that guy who just came up to me on the street uh, is pretty much, you know, he's, he's my editor. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to find out more about your films, people can go to ravenwoodfilms.com, right? Yeah, ravenwoodfilms.com. It's also at Raven Films on Twitter or at Sean underscore O'Banion without the apostrophe. Yeah. When you were on Sequest, did your last name similarity to somebody who created the show, did that help you get that job or was that just a coincidence? No, it's just a coincidence. I, I literally was on that set for three months. And for the whole entire three months, I asked people every day if there was anything I could do. And I didn't know about unions and I didn't know about sort of the rules of being hired. So for three months, I would ask, hey, can I do that for you? And people say, no, no, thanks, kids, we're good. But there was a night where they were going to do an exterior at the amphitheater, which actually doesn't even exist anymore. That's old. I am. They knocked it down for Harry Potter World. And they were putting the extras in a van, so I just got in the van uh, with the extras. And they drove <laughs> us all up the hill. And when we got to the top where they're setting up this exterior that was supposed to be a, an Earth Oceans World Conference, you know, they had about 100 extras, only sci-fi looking vehicles. I got out of the van and there was a guy yelling at another guy and he was saying, I can't 
you know, I don't have enough people here to put your trailers where you need them and get your makeup tables and stuff set up. So pick what you want done and I'll do that first. And I just walked over and raised my hand and said, I'll do the makeup tables. Where they go? And they both sort of looked at me and, and finally the, the guy who I realized was an assistant director said, okay, fine. Go with him, pull the makeup tables off that truck over there, put them in this room down here, put all the light bulbs in, plug them in, get them ready, set up the director's chairs for the cast to sit in and extras to sit in. Uh, and come back and find me. So I did that, came back to find him about 20 minutes later. I said, okay, that's done. And he said, uh, okay, here's a walkie-talkie and a headset. He said, you ever use it before? I said, no, sir. He said, all right, don't talk on it, just listen. If I tell you, lock it up, that means nobody walks through. When we cut, you can release people. Just stay here and do that, I'll come find you later. I said, okay, put the headset on. I called my dad. I said, dad, I think I just got a job. <laughs> And uh, I worked that I worked that whole night. Uh, it was a night shoot, so I worked all the way until basically sunrise. And he said, uh, the AD said to me at the end, he gave me an extra voucher that probably paid me the first night, which I still have, which is cool. My little receipt. And uh, and he said, I don't know how you get in the lot every day or who you know, but uh, <laughs> if you're here tomorrow at uh, at 9 a.m., I'll hire you. And I said, great. So I you know got everything together and showed up, and I worked the rest of the the first season that way. That's awesome. Yeah. Hopefully your story inspires a whole bunch of future filmmakers to sneak into places. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> recommend, you know, to clear myself legally. Right. I wouldn't recommend it these days. But like I said, it's a different world that we live in. Uh, and security is taken much more seriously. But, you know, I mean, even back then, like I said, when I was a kid, 11 years old, they took my picture and, you know, said I was trespassing. So it was a big deal. Uh, when I was 17... There used to be a sit-down commissary in the Universal lot. They don't have it now. It's more like a buffet kind of line that you just go through. Uh, but there used to be a, a place where you could actually make a reservation and have a lunch. So I decided that maybe if I called from off the lot and made myself a reservation, that my name would come up in the system. So for a while, that's how I started getting in. Was I'd go to the guard gate and say, I have a lunch meeting. And they'd look in the computer and there'd be my name, you know, 12 o'clock commissary. So they give me a pass that's supposed to be just for me to go there and then leave. But of course, I wouldn't leave. I'd go <laughs> have my quick lunch. I'd always have the lunch there uh, and then go walk around. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think there are ways to do it. And my feeling is if, if nobody's getting hurt, there's nothing wrong with it. Obviously, you know, I don't recommend that anyone break any laws. But yeah, it's, if I hadn't done it, I, I don't know that I'd be in the industry. So I don't know what I'd be doing. The only thing I ever wanted to do was be in the industry. I think more than sneaking in, it's a good example of the difference between wanting to do something and taking that first step to do something. Yeah, for sure. Going back to your time on the Quantum Leap set, one of the first sets you saw on Quantum Leap was the train set. Was that like half a train? And what was around it? And what did the whole uh, soundstage look like? When, when you walked in, it was very, very dark. I mean, because they were shooting. So the only lights there on are the, are the lights that are pointed into the set. They had a full train car, an actual train car in there. I don't remember if it had the wheels on. I doubt it. I think they just had the shell of it in there. And then there was a, another piece that was like a half of a train car uh, that was in front of that one. So, you know, if they were shooting, you could walk from car to car. And obviously everybody was sort of clustered in there watching them shoot. And I did walk in to the train when they were, when they were, obviously you couldn't, stand in there because it, it was an accurate train. It was a very thin hallway uh, and little rooms off the side. But I walked in because I wanted to see what was going on in there and where the camera was. And I met, her name was Alice Adair. She was the guest star for the episode. She was very sweet. And I remember the guy who played the villain actually scared me. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the episode. He's supposed to be her ex-husband and he's chasing them down and he keeps threatening to kill them. And and I just remember him being, you know, I remember them filming the scene where he says, you're not afraid of me or something like that. And, and Sam Beckett says, no. And he says, you should be because I'm going to kill you or something like mm -hmm, that. And mm -hmm. I just thought, oh, God. And then, <laughs> and then uh, on another day, they were doing the scene where Al is sitting in front of the board, basically, that are determining if they're going to finance the project anymore. And I didn't realize, you know, I, I 11 years old, I wasn't thinking about that they still had probably 15 more episodes to shoot that season. So all I heard was a snippet of dialogue where they were saying, you know, Admiral Calavici, we believe we're not going to continue 
the program. And, I, and as a little kid, I was like, oh, my God, are they canceling the show? <laughs> <laughs> what are they going to do? What are they going to do? Maybe Gene's leaving the show. What's happening here? Hmm. So, And then you realize, you know, when you're standing on the set, they give out sides, which are like shrunken versions of the day's shooting script, literally shrunken down so you can you can fit it in your back pocket. And so you can get that, but that's all you get. So if you don't get a full script, and I, I eventually swiped a pair of sides, you can see what they're going to say, but you can't see really what the scene that comes after or the scene that comes before. So I remember thinking, oh, man, maybe they're in trouble. <laughs> the show's going to get canceled. But no, it was, I mean, it was amazing to stand on that stage and see a train car. And obviously there's nothing out the window, but, and you're also, you're watching everything that the costumes were of the time period. I can't remember when that episode was set. I want to say like the 50s or something, late 50s. And then even the next episode to go into Disco Inferno and everybody's wearing butterfly collars and platform shoes and you just think the extras are all dressed up. I mean, it's, no matter what, even now, I'm, I make films and I still, I, I find the project just full of magic. And that's even when I know what's coming and I'm part of the process that makes sure that the things that are required are there. It's still a magical thing to me that there's 150 people all sort of working towards this one goal, which is one twenty fourth of a second. And so to be in there and and watch actors that that I just was starstruck about and perform these scenes and stand there on a train set and know that within a couple of weeks, I was going to be sitting at home on my dad's couch on a Wednesday night and watch that episode and go, hey, I stood right there. <laughs> you know, I, I was around the corner for that. Did your parents know you were doing this? Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad did. My dad was a notorious rule breaker, so <laughs> he, he was like, yeah, sounds cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did you stay a fan of Quantum Leap after your experience? Oh, yeah. I watched that show until they took it off. And I got to tell you, my personal favorite episode probably ever was MIA which I, I'm told, unfortunately, I have not revisited on DVD because I'm told that they didn't want to pay the rights to uh, Georgia on my mind. And to me, it was such a huge part of that episode. So I haven't revisited the episode, but that episode was always my favorite. So when the show came to a close and they tied it back to that episode, that was for me like one of the greatest things ever. Yeah. That, that episode just really resonated with me as a fan of the show. I would wholeheartedly agree with you on that. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend MA on Region 1 DVD, but if you can get a different region, or I believe Netflix actually has a proper song now. Oh, do they? Do the Region 2 discs have the music the way it should be? Yes, Region 2. I have the Region 2 discs. I don't think I'm supposed to. Uh, Are we allowed to? I don't know, but I have. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know what? If they're on Amazon, we can buy them. Exactly. That's where I got them, so. Uh, Yeah, I'll have to look that up, because that that was it. Yeah, great episode. I've worked with Bruce McGill before a couple of times, I think, uh, and who played the bartender mm-hmm. in, in those final episodes. And he's also a really fantastic guy and, and told me a lot of nice stories about his experience and even with Don Belisario and people on the show. So, but yeah, I mean, that experience, like I said, was a very formative thing for me to sort of see as a kid, to understand how it happens and understand that you really only shoot two or three pages a day on a television show and you're just you know, you're there for 12, 13, 14 hours a day and how the actors are able to keep an energy level up and match a scene. You know, you may shoot on Monday the scene where he comes into the train and walks into one of the rooms, but you don't shoot the room until Thursday for whatever reason. So he has to remember so that it's continuous. The performance is continuous. And just to learn stuff like that as a kid was pretty great and see how that happened. That was a really cool interview. I I wish I did cool stuff like that when I was a kid. But I, I I think my favorite part was that he got to like sit down and have lunch with Scott and Dean. And that was really neat. And they knew his secret and didn't tell anybody. That's pretty awesome. It really shows how cool they really are. That that makes you feel good, you know. I wish I did stuff like that when I was a kid, but I just didn't have the gumption. Yeah. You also weren't located right outside of a studio. If I was, I might have. Might have been my thing. I think that's really awesome. Every little piece of the puzzle we get brings us that much closer to knowing what it was like to be there during the production of Quantum Leap. Definitely a cool guy. 